Once upon a time on the shores of the Baltic, there was the capital of a small duchy, later to become a kingdom. It was a thriving and prosperous city, equipped with castles and fortifications, home to knights, kings, writers and philosophers, as well as the seat of an important university. Its name was Königsberg. No use looking it up on a map. Königsberg no longer exists, not under that name at least. You can find it nestled between Poland and Lithuania, under the name Kaliningrad. The map will show it to you as Russian territory, and that's not a mistake. Kaliningrad is what is called an exclave, a portion of national territory separated from the state to which it belongs, without territorial contiguity with it that is surrounded entirely by other states. Like all exclaves, Kaliningrad also has a special past behind it, and it's precisely its geographical and political anomaly that makes it one of the most dangerous and hot spots in the world today, and we'll find out why. First, however, we must go back to the time when the city was still called Königsberg founded by the monastic order of the Teutonic Knights in the 13th century and later becoming the capital of the Duchy of Prussia, from which the process of national unification began. Königsberg became part of the German Empire and was known by that name until 1946. Königsberg then, at least from the birth of the Kingdom of Prussia in 1701, was to all intents and purposes German territory, despite Polish and Lithuanian minorities. Following the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, East Prussia and Königsberg itself were separated from the rest of Germany by a strip of Polish territory, the Gdansk Corridor. And very close to Königsberg, a new independent national entity would arise, Lithuania. It would be Hitler, with the Polish invasion, who would re-establish territorial contiguity with Königsberg, at least until 1945. During the final stages of World War II, in fact, the town, like all of East Germany, didn't escape the offensive of the Soviets, who conquered and occupied the town after months of siege. But unlike the other territories of the now former East Prussia conquered by the Red Army, which at the end of the war would be divided between Soviet Poland and Lithuania, the Russians retained direct control over Königsberg and the surrounding area. They made it, in other words, an oblast, in effect, Russian territory. Königsberg then ceased to exist, and rose from the ashes of wartime Kaliningrad, renamed in honor of a Bolshevik revolutionary. Quite ironic when we think that Königsberg literally means King's Mountain. The Russians operated the real restyling of the city. Not only did they demolish most of the historical monuments related to the German past, by the way already heavily damaged by bombing, but they imposed the Russification of the city, relocating the German inhabitants left behind during the war to East Germany and replacing them with Russian Russian citizens. But what did the Russians do with this exclave? First, with the division of Europe into two blocks and following the formation of the Warsaw Pact, Kaliningrad was not an exclave as it is today. The socialist republics of Lithuania and Latvia, which geographically separate Kaliningrad from Russian territory, were at the time an integral part of the Soviet Union, which ensured territorial contiguity between Kaliningrad and the motherland. Not to mention the passage through Belarus, at the time also incorporated among the many socialist republics. Moreover, Soviet leaders had clear ideas about the city's fate from the very beginning. Indeed, Kaliningrad and its entire oblast became a military bastion by virtue of its strategic location right in the middle of the Baltic. It was for this reason that Stalin preferred to incorporate Kaliningrad into Russian rather than Lithuanian territories. Its location was vital to Soviet military fortunes, and so it could only depend directly directly on the Kremlin's wishes. Indeed, it was Stalin's own successor, Nikita Khrushchev, who proposed to the Lithuanian government the total cession of the oblast. But it was the Lithuanians who this time refused the offer, since it would have meant annexing a territory with a strong Russian-speaking minority. Remaining under Russian control from 1956, Kaliningrad would host the Soviet Baltic fleet, previously stationed in the port of Leningrad, present-day St. Petersburg. Indeed, just outside the city of Kaliningrad lies the port of Baltisk, which, unlike Leningrad and the other Soviet ports on the Baltic, doesn't freeze over in the colder months of the year. As a result, the oblast became one of the most militarized regions of the Soviet Union, reaching 100,000 soldiers. Interdicted to foreign visitors, all of Kaliningrad revolved around Moscow's wartime needs, and throughout the Cold War the oblast was an offensive projection of the Soviet Union to the NATO flank. With those few ruined monuments spared by the war and Soviet iconoclasm, including the cathedral that housed the remains of Immanuel Kant, one of the most prestigious figures originally from ancient Königsberg, the city had nothing left of its former glory. It had become a veritable military outpost and a nuclear warhead storage site. The conditions of the inhabitants halved from the pre-war period were in poverty and degradation. 
Upon the fall of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, Kaliningrad's fortunes didn't improve much. Certainly, the distance from the motherland was intensified. Indeed, since the three Baltic republics declared their independence, territorial contiguity with the territories of the Soviet Union was lacking for the Kaliningrad Oblast. Neither Poland nor Lithuania made any claims on a territory that was now home to an exclusively Russian-speaking population, despite the fact that the ancient Königsberg, between the 16th and 17th centuries, that is, before it passed into the Duchy of Prussia, had been part of the Kingdom of Poland I and of the Polish-Lithuanian Confederation later. Kaliningrad remained Russian territory, but given the city's precarious economic conditions, it couldn't survive without a direct supply of basic goods from Russia. In 1993, the post-Soviet government in Moscow was forced to sign an agreement with Lithuania that guaranteed, behind strict controls and exorbitant tariffs, supplies by train to the exclave via the infamous Suvalki Gap, a 65-kilometer-long strip of land linking Belarus, a vassal state of Moscow even after the fall of the Soviet Union, to the Kaliningrad Oblast, crossing the border between Poland and Lithuania. On the geopolitical and military implications of this strip of land today, we return later. Meanwhile, throughout the 1990s, given the economic precariousness of the newly formed Russian Federation, Kaliningrad had to fend for itself, opening up to trade with neighboring Germany, Poland and Lithuania, certainly more advantageous markets than the shattered post-Soviet Russia. But economic crisis and geographic isolation also meant a reduction in what had been the exclave's crowning achievement, its military capacity. Whether due to cutbacks in spending or Lithuanian controls on the transit of goods and people, the ground forces stationed in Kaliningrad fell from the 100,000 recorded in 1993 to 15,000 in 1998. Russia, on the other hand, needed the bulk of the troops in the south, in Chechnya, where throughout the second half of the 1990s and early 2000s it was forced to deal with separatists. And then, in Kaliningrad, being in the military was no longer convenient. Many officers, as well as many war industries, converted to more civilian purposes. The legendary fleet had lost all its former greatness, and as Felix Gramov, at the time head of the Russian Navy, would observe, its power was comparable to that of any other European fleet, certainly unable to be a threat to NATO. Kaliningrad was, in short, no longer the thorn in NATO's side, and its fleet could boast its own usefulness only in defensive and control areas and in peacetime, as in safeguarding sea trade. In a wartime scenario, according to Western experts, the exclave's isolation and small number of its armaments made Kaliningrad a weak pawn. On the other side of the coin, however, this weakening facilitated relations with NATO itself, which in turn reduced its military projection in the Baltic. What is more, the Russian Federation's new international role and its partnership with NATO involved Moscow and Kaliningrad itself in precisely those joint exercises, Baltops, once designed to defend the Baltic Straits from possible Soviet aggressions. Not everyone looked to Kaliningrad with confidence and serenity. Poland and Lithuania, which had only been free from the grip of Soviet troops for a few years, were very suspicious of the Russian giant. Kaliningrad certainly posed no threat to NATO, agreed. But the still immature defenses of Poland and Lithuania it did. After unsuccessfully calling for the total demilitarization of the Russian exclave, Poland and Lithuania, as well as the other Baltic republics, decided to shake off all these anxieties by applying for admission into NATO and the European Union. Poland was accepted into NATO in 1999, among others along with the Czech Republic and Hungary, thus beginning the much-feared eastern enlargement of the Atlantic Alliance. It was mainly the Russian military that was suspicious of these NATO initiatives, because they feared that it would all result in the installation of nuclear warheads and the deployment of troops in territories ever closer to Russian borders. And if Lithuania had also decided to follow in Polish footsteps toward NATO, Kaliningrad would have found itself even more isolated, because it was enclosed between two NATO countries. For the officials, there was no other solution. It was necessary to return to filling Kaliningrad with weapons and men as in the old days. In the Kremlin, they acted for the moment more on the diplomatic and political side. A country, in fact, couldn't join NATO if, for example, it had outstanding and unresolved territorial disputes. Taking advantage of this clause, Russian President Boris Yeltsin bought time by signing agreements with the three Baltic republics on border regulation, but these were not ratified by the Duma, thus leaving the dispute open. One of these agreements, in 1997, concerned precisely the borders between the Kaliningrad Oblast and Lithuania. In this climate of renewed distrust, the NATO military intervention in Kosovo distanced Russia even further from the West, causing it to discover a valuable ally in neighboring Belarus. 
It's no coincidence that the military exercise ZAPAD 99, which simulated the NATO nuclear attack on Kaliningrad, would be carried out precisely with Minsk. The exclave returned to its peculiar strategic importance, especially under the new Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Indeed, greater support for the navy was promised, as well as military reinforcement of the region. The very man then commander of the Baltic fleet, Admiral Vladimir Yegorov, would be elected in 2000, demonstrating that the people of Kaliningrad themselves still had the military apparatus in high regard and wanted increased defense spending. In the Baltic, meanwhile, NATO activities continued, and Russian officials feared at any moment that Lithuania might block the transit of goods to Kaliningrad. Lithuania, which, along with Estonia and Latvia, will join NATO in 2004. Although these signals portended the return to the Soviet past, there were also a series of countermeasures that, at least for the time being, calmed the waters. First, the establishment of the Russian NATO Council, then the 2002 agreement between Moscow and Washington on nuclear arms reduction. It was then Putin himself who avoided blowing on the fire of mistrust when he welcomed with some benevolence the entry of the three Baltic republics into NATO. Enlargement, that he said, was unnecessary, but after all didn't directly threaten Russia. The early 2000s resulted in an alternation of distrust and closeness between NATO and Russia. But Kaliningrad still remained a knot to be solved, and Lithuania's entry not only into NATO but also into the European Union in 2004 complicated matters, and not only militarily. Vilnius' succession to the Schengen Convention made the issue of passage to Kaliningrad from Russia even thornier, a situation that Putin denounced as detrimental to national sovereignty and the human rights of Russian citizens. Then there was fear among many officials about the European Union's real intentions, namely to make Kaliningrad a new West Berlin. In fact, no final agreement was ever reached between between the European Union and Russia on the issue of transit visas through Lithuania, and all negotiations stalled in recent years. Yes, because in the meantime, the Russian economy had grown at a stable pace, and as a result, military spending had also been revived. The Kremlin's foreign policy thus became more aggressive, beginning in 2008, with the invasion of Georgia. Dating from the year before, among other things, was the Bush administration's decision to deploy an anti-Iranian missile shield in Poland and the Czech Republic, a move that was obviously not appreciated by the Kremlin. And it was 2005 that saw the first colored revolutions in the former socialist republics. It was Ukraine, with the Orange Revolution, that set the course. Relations between Russia and NATO became as frosty as ever, and Kaliningrad was still at risk of isolation with Lithuania, which in response threatened to block Russian military transit to Kaliningrad until the end of the conflict. It was Russia itself, however, that had announced the withdrawal of 800 tanks from Kaliningrad as a sign of its non-aggressive intentions. By now, however, the die had been cast, and a new phase of total dependence on the motherland opened for Kaliningrad, given the new isolation into which it had fallen. The United States and Poland signed an agreement to deploy missile warheads on Polish soil, and the Russian response was not long in coming, missiles also in Kaliningrad. This was what was decided by the Russian president at the time, Dmitry Medvedev, partly in reaction to the presence of American warships deployed in the Black Sea. According to Medvedev, the situation in Georgia had been used as a pretext to implement anti-Russian military measures in Europe. If the situation in 2008 was tense, it could only get worse in 2014. Following the unilateral annexation of Crimea, Russia rediscovered in Kaliningrad a key strategic and organizational base. As early as 2013, large-scale exercises were held in the exclave, involving 9,000 troops, 55 naval vessels, and the entire air force, according to The Economist. And in 2016, the much-feared Iskander missiles were finally deployed. In short, more of a visa problem. For at least eight years, then, Kaliningrad that has returned to its old war tradition has been in danger of becoming the epicenter of a conflict that was as unplanned as it was accidental. How much was risked, for example, in April 2015, when in disguise over the Baltic, a Russian jet skimmed the US spy plane, narrowly avoiding a collision that could have cost dearly. This episode is certainly not an isolated one. And let's not forget that Kaliningrad Oblast, in addition to the Baltic fleet, is home to the Chernyakovsk and Danskoye air bases, from which Russian jets can attack the Baltic states in a very short time, leaving them insufficient time for a counteroffensive. 
in a sense with the Baltic increasingly an Atlantic lake and with the imminent entries of Sweden and Finland into NATO, Kaliningrad assumes even more vital importance for Russia today than it did at the height of the Cold War. The military axis of Kaliningrad and the naval bases of St. Petersburg and Kronstadt Island in the Gulf of Finland represents the Russian screen against NATO's Baltic projections. A screen, however, interrupted by Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia themselves, whose two islands of Yuma and Sarema go to form together with the Danish island of Bornholm, the Swedish islands of Öland, Gutska Sandun, and especially Gutland, the nerve center of NATO operations, a stranglehold on Russian ports and Kaliningrad itself. The war, however, finally came in Ukraine for the time being, but the news of these days opens up the possibility of an extended conflict right toward the Baltic. Indeed, Lithuania is back to blocking the transit of Russian goods through the Subauki Gap, in compliance with sanctions set by the European Union. In fact, they are keen to point out from Vilnius that blockade would cover only sanctioned goods, so not foodstuffs, for example. All that would be left to supply Kaliningrad would be the sea route, which is expensive and logistically complex. For Moscow, this act is a clear violation of its sovereignty. While waiting for a decision from Brussels, Russia, in the person of Dmitry Medvedev, now vice president of the Russian Security Council, has threatened economic and energy retaliation, not excluding, of course, the worst case scenarios. And not only with regard to Vilnius, maybe. The governor of Kaliningrad himself, Anton Alikhanov, has let it be known that he has submitted draft proposals to the Kremlin in response to the blockade. Proposals that present unspecified measures, but critical of Lithuania, although it can't be ruled out, according to many, that Russian economic and energy reactions may also involve other countries, maybe just the other two Baltic republics. Indeed, some analysts point out the concomitance with the temporary blocking of the two sections of the Nord Stream pipeline for maintenance, and the fear is that this halt to gas supplies could last longer, at least until a satisfactory agreement on the fate of Kaliningrad is reached. But the Tsuvauki gap today for the Russians has an importance that goes beyond the economic level alone. Under the pretext of intervening to protect the supplies to its exclave, Russia could also intervene militarily to secure control of the gap via Belarus, of course, but doing so would create a rupture on the Baltic front of NATO, cutting off Lithuania and then Latvia and Estonia from Poland, that is, from the rest of NATO. Actions that could in turn result in the first step to invade the very three Baltic republics, even though, clearly, at that point NATO Article 5 would be triggered automatically. In this sense, it's from what will happen in the next few days, in the three border between Poland, Lithuania and Kaliningrad, that it will be possible to tell whether this conflict will spread with incalculable outcomes. It would also remain to be understood exactly what lies behind Vilnius' decision. Is it a simple compliance with European directives or a deliberate provocative strategy? To what end, then, and directed by whom? Beyond everything, what is emerging in the Kaliningrad issue these days is a kind of NATO split that sees the Baltic and Scandinavian countries as the main reference of the United States in European affairs, partly because they are the most exposed to Russian retaliation. For its part, Kaliningrad seems ready to take the field. In the end, war in ancient Königsberg may have arrived. Well, we are done for today as well. Thank you all for your attention and see you in the next video. Ciao!